thank you. Uh, I'm starting to see the uh, Ricky's sort of her method to her madness here. It's uh, a connection. Jay sort of uh, lined up a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about now. I, I, a there is. Yeah. Yeah. It's coming clear. Um, but I, I execute, I actually attended New Organizing uh, Institute's training and uh, on a sort of on the ground where the rubber touches the road uh, way, I execute a lot of <laughs> the public narrative, the theory of change, the online, offline, and try to merge the grassroots with the grass tops uh, in a state that is, is very backwards. So um, I'll give you a little bit about the organization um, that I work with. SAVE is actually an acronym for Safeguarding American Values for Everyone. It was started about 20 years ago. Uh, during the Anita Bryant campaign uh, to uh, wage war against uh, gay people uh, in the state of Florida. And by the time she did enough damage, a small group of people in Miami-Dade County uh, decided to come together and uh, fight back. So uh, SAVE was formed in the process. Uh, and at that time, we were able to defeat one of her constitutional amendments, which would have made it impossible for uh, gay people to be recognized, the LGBT community to be recognized uh, in non-discrimination policies. So uh, unfortunately today, even though we stopped uh, that wave, uh, Florida is still one of the 29 states where you can be fired uh, if you're gay. It's one of the 36 states where you can be fired if you're transgender. Uh, until recently, uh, Florida was one of the only states uh, that did not allow people who are gay and lesbian to become parents and adopt. Uh, that ruling was overturned by the ACLU of Florida's work uh, in the courts uh, just last year, October. We're actually ranked number 46 of all uh, states with regards to LGBT inclusiveness and acceptance. Um, you can find that ranking on Equality Giving, which gives you the rankings of all the, the states in the union. Um, and I'll give you a little bit about myself as well. So I um, was born into a household that was a Republican household. It was conservative. Uh, it was... Uh, led by a, a Cuban-American uh, and uh, really run by a Puerto Rican-American and my mother. Um, I was born in New York, I came to Miami, and uh, we didn't have too much money. And I got to a point in my life where I had to make a decision. Nobody had gone to college in my family, so uh, my father uh, was strongly encouraging me to enlist. Uh, he was a, a veteran, and he thought it would be valuable for me to also participate. I, of course, didn't want to do that. My mom was working behind the scenes, and she figured out a way to get me some money to go to college. And at that moment, I talked to my father, and I said, OK, I'm not enlisting. I'm going to college. I'm going to make something of myself. And at that time, I realized, as I was getting involved, what he really wanted for me was a way to give back, a way to contribute, a way to serve our country. And in the end, as a result of my profession and my career and the work that I do now, I realized that I've achieved that goal. I'm not wearing a uniform while I do that. And he used guns and bullets to do that for people in a foreign country, and I use stories, uh, and I use statistics to do that today. Uh, and I work, uh, interestingly enough, what makes my story unique is that I'm not a member of the community. I'm married to a woman, and I identify as heterosexual. My gender identity is male, I'm cisgender, and we have a three-year-old baby. So I do this work because when I was being raised uh, in a household that had an aunt with nine children, and seven of them were gay and lesbian, and we used to have our Christmas dinners. Must have been the water. Um, <laughs> my normal included LGBT people. So it was interesting as I got older uh, to see, you know, in college and as I started to uh, uh, join the workforce, I realized the discrepancies and equality that existed between people. So I got involved, uh, and now I'm the executive director of an organization that's dedicated to doing this. Uh, that's a little bit of my story of self. And we get to use that on a daily basis. That public narrative that, that Jay was talking about and that we execute on a daily basis is what allows us to engage the community. Apathy is really high, not only across the country with regards to the LGBT movement, but in Florida especially. You know, a research report recently done showed that only 3.6% of LGBT Americans give money to advocacy. 3.2% of those give $100 or more, up to $1,000, and 0.2% give $1,000 or more. And we, we've been hearing this common theme that uh, LGBT people are across the board. They're, they come from many walks of life, and they're fully part of the broader community. So in my community in South Florida, I have men and women that give millions of dollars to arts and culture and the museums and to children's causes, but they're not supporting advocacy. 
Uh, and it's an educational process that takes place not only with the broader community, what we call the movable middle, the people that we're trying to get to, uh, the straight folks, but it's also a it's an, a, an educational process to the community themselves. Uh, I'm oftentimes trying to talk to two men that uh, have considerable wealth, uh, and they're trying to talk me out of marriage equality and non-discrimination, and I won't be fired from my job because I own the company, and I don't have to worry about adopting children because I don't want to do that or I don't want to enlist in the military. But I often have to remind them, yeah, but it's about the 13-year-old boy in Hialeah, which is a small city in, uh, in Miami-Dade County, uh, that doesn't have the means to protect himself. He's questioning his orientation, his identity, uh, and he's being discriminated against. So the educational process is continuous. We do that by uh, implementing our theory of change. The terminology, Jay. Um, Florida also competes with a number of movements. It's very backwards in that state. We have a governor that has uh, openly professed his opposition to gay and lesbian people. Uh, he's appointed people in positions that carry that same mission. So his most recent appointment to the Department of Children and Families, uh, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Wilkins, who ran an adoption agency. He was the finance chair for an adoption agency. Unfortunately, the adoption agency only adopted to people that were Christian affirming uh, Jesus affirming individuals. So now he is a government official and he's carrying out a mission from the government But his, his walk of life his background comes from one that clearly at, at times is at odds with the LGBT community So how do we make progress and how do we find solutions to navigate change in the state of Florida? And I think if there's anything I'm good at it's that it's being innovative and it's being able to come up with stuff that makes progress Nothing monumental is going to pass in Florida. We're not, pa we're not passing standalone monumental legislation. Unfortunately, we're not in Massachusetts or Vermont. Um, so we got to look for the incremental stuff. Uh, and I often get sort of called to the carpet by other LGBT activists when we talk about incrementalism. Um, but maybe that was why they hired me, because I was able to do that, because I don't directly walk in the shoes. So we're able to make small pieces of change that at one time may not protect the entire community, but protects people. And ultimately, that's what we're here for. So our theory of change and, and, and taking what we have to uh, turn it into what we need so that we can get what we want. And it's very fundamental that what we do is connect individual people, people that are going about their daily lives, with the work that we're doing. And we do that by executing a theory of change and a framework that is through a lens of human rights. When I talk to legislators in the state of Florida, which are very socially conservative, our state legislature is run uh, by very socially conservative Republicans, uh, both the House and the Senate and the cabinet. And when I speak to them, uh, we're often talking not about the particulars about the issue, but we're talking about that framework of human rights. And it allows them to imagine themselves not having these rights, as opposed to the specifics. So when we do that and we execute that idea, we often do it by building power, using technology. And those are the two pieces I wanted to talk about today. Uh, and hopefully these are things that I talk about that you might be able to use yourselves uh, when you go back to your parts of the world uh, and continue to make change. So that idea of building power is something that is critical to our work. We build power by amassing a movement and fueling the movement. We talked about the, Jay mentioned the petition drive, and it's right, it's, it doesn't change the world, but it definitely fuels the movement. We sent out a petition this morning, and got about a thousand signatures, and these are people that otherwise would not have been connected with the work that we're doing. So we're constantly building the movement and fueling it. With regards to building power, there's these two sort of balancing acts that we have. One is the perception of power versus the reality of power, and we tinker with both at any given time. Um, when I first started at SAFE three years ago, there was a high level of perception of power with the organization. I realized that that bank account was sort of depleted though. When I looked into it, there wasn't a lot of power there. Over the past three years, we've been trying to build that power. And as a result, uh, we were able to play a role in getting Miami-Dade County Mayor uh, Carlos Jimenez elected. Uh, Miami-Dade County Mayor went through a recall after the California governor recall uh, a few years ago. This was the largest recall in the country. Um, and there was a sea of about 11 candidates. Uh, these 11 candidates were all running for mayor. Some of them were supportive of LGBT issues and some of them weren't. 
It got down to a runoff between two candidates, an existing county commissioner, as well as another mayor, that city I mentioned before, he was actually the mayor of Hialeah. By utilizing our theory of change, by executing a, a public narrative with our community, online and offline, we were able to do a couple of things. Number one, we were able to create an enemy, and there's nothing like moving somebody when you have an enemy. Uh, the Christian Family Coalition was upset that we were getting involved in the race. So the Christian Family Coalition started sending out emails and news reports talking about the homosexualist agenda and how they're pushing it. I didn't even know that was a word until they said it. <laughs> it isn't, right? <laughs> uh, and so you started pushing emails and press, and uh, that got a lot of our community pissed off, which is a good thing. It moved them. It broke that inertia. Uh, the other piece was it, was a, it gave us an opportunity to express our values, the organization's values, to the community in the form of messaging, in the form of Facebook posts, Twitter feeds, in the form of media. Uh, we actually did a video as a result of it. Another way that moved the community. In the end, uh, five days before the election, one of the candidates said that he would repeal the domestic partnership ordinance of Miami-Dade County. As a result, we sent out a robocall, we sent out uh, mass media, we did social media, new media, and we were able to get about 5,000 of our 10,000 registered voters to go out and vote. The, the uh, vote was decided by less than 4,000 votes. Uh, I don't know if we helped him win, but we can definitely take credit for it. Uh, 5,000 votes is a big number, especially in a county uh, like Miami-Dade County of 2.5 million people where only about 200,000 people uh, decide elections. Um, so we were able to do that. Now, that's where we sort of merged that perception of power with the real political power. It took us three years to get there. I couldn't do that three years ago when I first started with SAVE. I would have gotten 10 people to go vote. So over the year, we've been building that narrative, the public narrative, with the community, online and offline, using message that, messages that resonate with them, that interest them, that connect them back to our values and back to our mission. Um, that second piece that really uh, we feel is, is part of the equation in building power is this idea of visibility through shared strategic alliances. So our, our strategy is purposeful. It is motivational. Uh, and it's, it's innovative. Uh, sure, we have a five-year strategy, but I'm in the midst of a amended two-year strategy right now going into the 2012 elections. So if we need to project power, and we do that through our communication, more specifically low-cost communication, we were at a place where we embraced technology, we embraced social media, we used that to apply pressure back to the mayor, who we helped get elected, who then sat down with us and said, how do I help the community? Many people came to us and said, CJ, this was the first time I ever heard Miami-Dade County mayors that were running for election talk about LGBT issues. It was the first time it got to that level. Um, so we sat down with the mayor, uh, we had a discussion, and we figured out a way to work with the mayor's office to do a project very similar to the Presidential Appointments Project. I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with that, with the Victory Fund. Uh, but it's an idea which provides uh, highly qualified, highly effective people uh, in the form of resumes and portfolio to the president, and in our case, the mayor, so that he can appoint highly effective, highly qualified, openly gay people to government. I was talking to a donor the other day, he used the word infiltrate, which I don't know if I necessarily want to use that word, but it gets the point across. We sat down with the mayor, he loved the idea. We are working right now on a project that's going to get some of our key leadership into positions of power. Now again, minus us changing policy, changing legislation, without that sort of work being available to us, we're looking for the other stuff that we can do that's going to build and provide a primer to get us to a point where we can change policy. Um, this other piece about visibility uh, with the Miami Appointments Project, the Mayoral Appointments Project, was we thought it was an opportunity to bring together other organizations, which is something that often doesn't happen in the LGBT movement, organizations working together, unfortunately. I don't know if that's the case in other movements. Uh, Miami Dade is saturated with LGBT organizations. There's about 20 of them. Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce, there's about four organizations focusing on youth. Uh, there's organizations solely focused on transgender issues, on social welfare and health issues. Uh, so we found an opportunity to bring these organizations together through the Mayoral Appointments Project and sit them down and provide their input, provide them a place where they can also give their best and brightest, and again, an opportunity to get LGBT people into the broader community. Because these are folks that are sitting on boards that focus on public 
art in public places. These are people that are sitting on boards that focus on things like youth advocacy, issues that resonate with the broader community. Again, there's been that common theme about LGBT people being part of the broader community, and we truly believe that. There's no better way we feel like than getting them into positions of power. So that when last year, the chairman of the Community Relations Board of Miami-Dade County, who was the evangelical uh, Haitian preacher, a uh, very uh, powerful uh, individual, never heard any of our issues at the Community Relations Board. As a result of this project, we appointed somebody to the Community Relations Board, and now when uh, the chair has something to say that's usually negative about gay people, we have somebody on that committee that can go speak to them and talk to them directly. And what kind of change does that make? I'm not sure, but I know it's better than no one talking to them. You know, we don't track that type of stuff. Am I getting time? No, I'm not. It's a stop right next to me. Um, so I think the bottom line for us is a local LGBT advocacy organization, one that's trying to make change. We look for ways to become the source for our legislators, for our lawmakers, for our opinion leaders. And wouldn't it be an amazing place if all of you, your representative of your particular organizations and your movements, wouldn't it be a great place if our lawmakers saw us as that source? You think of home improvement and the source is Home Depot. Well, we're striving to be the Home Depot of the LGBT movement in, in Florida. And it's working. The other day, Rick Scott started to follow us on Twitter. And if we were not relevant and not making any noise, why would they waste the time to follow us? Strive to be that source. Use things like the public narrative, the theory of change, uh, engage the community. I think that's what we're doing on a daily basis. If you're looking for more information, you can go to saveday.org, uh, and I can definitely make myself available for how we execute a lot of our strategies. Thank you.